Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. I was 24 years old when I saw Katsuhiro Otomo's Akira for the first time. And if I told you that it blew me away, that would just be a ridiculous understatement. I was so impressed by the movie that I went out and I tried to find everything else that he had done. Most of those movies were shorts. And actually, back in those days, it was difficult to find them. Somehow, I found a place that still rented VHS movies, believe it or not. And I was able to rent copies of Neo Tokyo and Robot Carnival, which were two of the omnibus movies where you could find these shorts by Katsuhiro Otomo. I also saw Steam Boy. And I was just amazed by this man's work. So, you know, it was really quite a moment for me. Some years passed after that, and one day I was just browsing the bookshelves at the library, which is what I do basically all of the time when I'm not sleeping or eating or, you know, working. And I saw the first volume of the manga, and I was like, why not? You know, I have seen the movie, let's experience the graphic novel now. Many years later, this is where we are right now, I decided it was time for a reread and a rewatch. And I basically went out to the libraries once again and I gathered the copies and the different volumes of the manga. They are here. I have done my exercise for the day. And I wanted to share my experience with you uh, re-watching and rereading this great work by Katsuhiro Otomo. So let's look at the graphic novel first. Uh, just to give you a little bit of general information, Akira was serialized and that started in the year 1982. And as you could see just now, it basically consists of six uh, rather thick volumes, okay, that you can see here. All of them in glorious black and white except for some uh, images and some scenes very briefly at the beginning of each volume. And you're going to see that every one of these volumes has a kind of a subtitle or a subheading. For example, volume number one is titled Tetsuo. Then we have two volumes, the number two and number three, Akira, so Akira part one, Akira part two. And then the following volumes are titled K part one and K part two, and volume number six is titled Kaneda. So this has been described as cyberpunk. That is probably the most important label that you will hear. And that, as you probably know, can mean many things. But basically for the purposes of this analysis, we're going to take it to mean two things. High tech plus low life. Okay, that is probably one of the best ways to approach this genre or subgenre. I thought as I was reading it, this is a connection that many critics have made of uh, Blade Runner because of the urban decay. Another connection that many critics have also made is with the Clockwork Orange because of this idea of the youth in revolt. You know, these gangs who are bored and they resort to violence and drugs and all of those kinds of things because of just the tedium of this, you know, ultra modern type of lifestyle. And then as I was reading it and watching it, I also thought of 2001 A Space Odyssey, probably because of that final scene in, in the movie. So I think that is the connection that I made right there. And also of the body horror films of David Cronenberg, things like Videodrome, you know, probably because of Tetsuo's transformation towards the end of the story. And speaking of the story, let me tell you a little bit about that in case you are not familiar with it. So Akira begins, in my opinion, in one of the best possible ways. It begins with somebody who just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, okay? And this someone is uh, Tetsuo, okay, who is age 15 when the story begins. And he's just hanging out with friends as the story begins. He is, uh, you know, riding motorcycles and doing the kind of thing that uh, his friends usually do, this little gang that he belongs to, when they almost run over a really weird elderly looking kid. Okay, so it's a very strange moment right there. This kid, it gets even weirder because this kid basically prevents the crash through telekinesis. Okay, and then after that, Tetsuo has an accident, he is sent to the hospital. Almost immediately after that, the military show up, okay? And also, with the military, there is a young man and a young woman who are also looking for, for this elderly-looking kid. So everybody seems to be looking for this weird kid who has telekinetic powers. And then get this, when Tetsuo is released from the hospital, he has also developed telekinetic powers, and he just feels awful, and he's also dependent on a drug. So that is the situation that we have uh, right here at the beginning of Akira. Now that is Tetsuo, right? But on the opposite side, we have his friend Kaneda. 
He is his childhood friend and he's basically the hero of uh, this great epic uh, graphic novel. He's also searching for Tetsuo because he wants to know what happened to him. They were friends, right? They were childhood friends. So along the way, Kaneda means the young woman who was also looking for the elderly looking kid. Her name is Kei, okay? And very soon a type of connection develops between these two characters, Kaneda and Kei. So as Tetsuo becomes more and more powerful and more dangerous, we learn that everything here in the story is connected to a military project, a secret project, titled or named Akira. Okay, So Akira is basically about the efforts to control this source of power that destroyed Tokyo many years ago and that has basically gone out of control and become a very serious threat to everybody. That is the element that connects the entire story. So let's talk a little bit about some features that you can find in this graphic novel. I would say that Akira is just a hyperkinetic graphic novel because the action is just non-stop. We are constantly shifting uh, from one scene to another, from one location to another, but everything is tied together by this quest for Akira, which at the beginning we don't really know what it is. Obviously that is the name of a person, but we don't really know at the beginning violence abounds okay it's like uh, there are explosions every five pages sometimes even more often than that and destruction when it happens is just absolute so if you like that kind of thing the explosions and that type of action then this graphic novel is definitely something that you're going to enjoy however there are also many mo moments of comic relief throughout the novel that i really uh, enjoyed and they work as a type of seasoning to the story, if you ask me. So it's a really nice combination. It's a really nice uh, alternation between this explosion type of thing and then this moments of comic relief. And most of the time, just so you know, these humorous scenes, they involve Kaneda, especially when he is interacting with Kei. But there are also other moments of humor that you're going to find, even involving a character like the Colonel, who is the one who embodies the military in, in this story. So I was thinking about some themes, you know, uh, basically what, what can we say about Akira in terms of some of the topics or the subjects that it includes. And the first one that I could think of probably at the most obvious level, this is that the things that we create, you know, in this case technology or any type of technology that we come up with, may come back to haunt us. Okay, so I guess in that sense you could say that maybe this is a modern type of Frankenstein story with Frankenstein and the monster. A uh, Frankenstein story for the late uh, 20th century. Another idea that you see here in Akira is that uh, we should not trust anybody. Okay, trust no one. And you're going to see why I say that in a second. But especially do not trust anybody in authority. Okay, and in this case you have the authority is basically represented by the colonel who stands for the military. And uh, the reason why I say trust no one is because there is an obvious connection here with the X-Files, which is basically my favorite TV show, and by extension with Stranger Things, right? Because as you know, Stranger Things and the X-Files, I mean, Stranger Things is really an homage to the X-Files and Stephen King and so many other uh, shows, movies, books from the 80s. We also have the dangers of experimenting with humans, obviously, uh, especially in this case with children, because that is what is going on here in Akira. Another element that you're going to find in the X-Files and in Stranger Things. And finally, I would say that at the end of the day, you know, and at the risk of stating the obvious here, this is really a great anti-war fable or parable comparable, I would say, to Godzilla, right? So it's not surprising that this is a Japanese uh, story. So some conclusions about the manga before we explore the uh, anime, the film. Akira, I believe, definitely deserves its uh, status as a cult classic, as, you know, one of the greatest manga uh, ever done. This is a really compelling story, and it has really great uh, character development. It's really superb in that sense. And what I fell in love with personally, you know, if you ask me, okay, one aspect of Akira that you really enjoyed and that was unexpected or just beautiful, I really like the setting. Okay, this, this sense of urban decay, of course, the kind of thing that you can find in Blade Runner, but also just a neo-baroque uh, architecture, the attention to detail, especially when you see these vast expanses, right, these vast areas of the city. Otomo is just amazing at capturing that, right, this 
expands this urban space you know I love how he does that and then this may be just me right but I, I could also tell you know that this story was set in the 1980s I, I kept thinking of shows like Robotech you know things like that I don't know it just brought me back to that kind of aesthetic that you found uh, in 80s types of animated films and also graphic novels or comic books or things like that. So I would say, you know, that the bottom line for the manga that Akira is just a beautiful, gorgeous, postmodern epic. You know, for an entire generation, this is almost like the Iliad. So I really enjoyed reading it. Now, uh, we have talked about the manga, let's move on, let's explore uh, the film a little bit and how that process has been, you know, the translation from the page to the screen. So, like many people, as I said before, I really experienced Akira first as a movie, okay? Uh, for good, good or ill or both, that's the way that it happened. The movie came out in 1988 and it also became a cult classic almost immediately, you know? The fact that it was directed by the original artist that was involved in producing the graphic novel, you know, Katsuhiro Otomo, he uh, wrote or drew the, the graphic novel, both things, and also he directed the film. So that is definitely a plus right there, because the process of adaptation, right, this going from the page to the screen, becomes much smoother that way. There are many changes, and even if you don't like the changes, at least you can say, well, it was the decision of the creator of the story. So that makes it just amazing. And the movie was just tremendously influential. Okay, it's, uh, think of later movies that uh, were influenced by this. You could mention, for example, Ghost in the Shell. You could mention even something like The Matrix. So there are tremendous movies that have been influenced by Akira. And one of the things that Akira did, and I think you know this is its claim to fame, basically, is that it proved that anime could be a suitable vehicle for sophisticated, thought-provoking stories that were uh, oriented towards adults, right? There were many movies, uh, many Japanese animated movies before Akira that also did this. But this is a movie that reached quite a wide audience, you know, in Japan and abroad. So that's where the importance of Akira lies, you know, at least one of the places in which you can see it. So let's talk about the story, okay, in, in the film, right? So the story begins with an explosion in the year 1988, which is the year that the movie came out, and then we are immediately told that we are now in 2019, okay, so 31 years after World War III, okay, after this huge explosion that basically destroyed Tokyo, and now it's Neo-Tokyo, right, in the year 2019. So the first scenes that you see show you urban decay, people hanging out at dirty bars, you know, motorcycle gangs, things like that. And in the first 10 minutes, we are already exposed to some really graphic violence. You know, we can also tell that there's going to be a supernatural element in this movie. We see the explosion also caused by that elderly looking kid that I told you about before, and Tetsuo is sent to the hospital. So basically, the movie begins in a much, uh, very similar way to, to the way that the graphic novel begins. In that sense, you can tell that it's the same story. Now one thing uh, that you're going to notice is that there are many differences between the graphic novel and the movie. And the first one that I wanted to mention is the fact that the movie is more focused. Okay, let me explain what I mean by this. I think this idea that the movie is more focused makes perfect sense because there is plenty of room for elaboration and for even for tangents in the manga. We have six volumes, after all, amounting to several uh, hundreds and, and even thousands of pages. So uh, Tetsuo's story, if you look at the graphic novel, is an important element. But it, in the film, when you move to the film, it is clearly the focus. Okay, that's what I mean. The, the, the film really focuses on Tetsuo's story and his experience after he has this encounter with that kid that he almost ran over. So some scenes have been added to the movie because of this, because we have this focus right here. For example, uh, you may remember if you have seen the movie Tetsuo's Hallucinations at the Hospital. That is one of my favorite scenes. Okay? That is not, you're not going to find that in the graphic novel. You're going to find other types of scenes involving Tetsuo, uh, maybe even hallucinations, but not precisely that one that you see in the film. I love that scene. It's really effective, you know? So I think you could argue that in the movie, Tetsuo's character is developed a little bit more than he is in the graphic novel, because here he really is the center of attention. 
Another major difference that you're going to find is that in the movie, uh, we don't really have the comic relief scenes, okay? You're going to find them in the novel every now and then. They're there all the time, but they're just virtually gone from the film. There are a few moments of comedy in the movie, okay? But this is overall just a very serious and, and very dark movie. This is probably the main difference that somebody who has read the novel, somebody who goes from the experience of the graphic novel to the movie, is going to notice, okay? Now, uh, judging the film for itself, which is something that I always try to do, by the way, you know, as I always say, a, a book is a book and the film is a film, I would say that this is not really a shortcoming, okay? This is not something that I missed particularly. I really enjoyed the comic relief scenes while I was reading the novel, but I get the feeling that those comedic uh, moments would not really have worked well in, in the movie, okay? I think the movie has a certain tone to it, and much of the appeal of Akira has to do with that dark, uh, serious tone, and the comic scenes would just not have uh, helped in that sense. Another difference that you're going to notice is that uh, in the novel there are quite a few allusions to drug use, okay, and depictions of drug use on the part of the teenagers, including Kaneda, which I think would maybe change our perception of Kaneda in the film if this were true there. But what I wanted to say was this, this drug use element has really been toned down in the film. Even Tetsuo's dependence on the drug after he has this uh, encounter, right, after he goes to the hospital and he develops the telekinetic powers, even that has been de-emphasized in the movie. And part of the reason for, for this, right, for many of these omissions that I'm, that I'm telling you about, is precisely that the manga is just really long and elaborate, right, and you don't really have enough time in the film to develop all of these elements. It would seem maybe a little bit overloaded if you try to do that. And let me tell you, if you haven't seen the film, the film already has quite a fast pace, okay? So if you add more to it, it would just, you know, probably seem rushed or seem like a summary of the novel. And that's not the kind of thing that you want in the movie. Another thing I noticed was that uh, when it comes to Tetsuo's interactions with other characters, there has been a change regarding the character of Kaori, for example. Okay. In the graphic novel, Kaori is a bit of a hostage, really. She is referred to as Tetsuo's pet at, w at one point. So basically, she is yeah, just like a hostage, and they develop feelings for each other. So I guess you could say she develops a kind of uh, Stockholm Syndrome. That's the situation that we have going on between them. Whereas in the film, they already know each other, and they are a couple. They are boyfriend and, and girlfriend, if you want to call them that, from the very beginning. So we're talking about even before Tetsuo has the accident and he develops the powers. So that's a kind of a kind of a slight difference that you will find between the two stories. But also there is quite a bit of a difference between the interaction, uh, I mean in the interaction between Tetsuo and Kaneda. Okay? In the movie, Tetsuo complains that Kaneda was always telling him what to do, that he was always bossing him around. So the story really focuses on that grudge uh, that Tetsuo holds when it comes to his relationship with Kaneda. They are definitely friends, but there is that tension between them because Kaneda is perceived, at least by Tetsuo, as a kind of a boss figure for this gang. The interaction, therefore, in the movie becomes more personal between them because of that focus, once again. So that is what's going on uh, here. But you don't get as much of that in the graphic novel because, once again, you know, the focus on the graphic novel is not exactly uh, Tetsuo, or at least not in the sense that you can see it in the film. There are also in the manga some additional characters. Okay, so there are some characters in the graphic novel that in the movie they barely appear or they appear as background characters. Some of them have directly disappeared. And I wanted to give you the example of two of them. The first one that I wanted to mention is Lady Miyako. Okay, she is the leader of a religious cult and she is really influential, really important as a character in the graphic novel, but she barely appears in the movie. There are just a few seconds that we are shown this character and she's just a background character right there. And the other one, perhaps most importantly, at least for me, is the character of Chiyoko. Okay, she is Kei's friend and maybe you could say a bit of a sister slash mother figure to her. And she's just gone from the movie. She doesn't appear at all. And I really missed her, okay, because she is just a hilarious character. She's this really uh, big and strong and tough and almost indestructible woman. She provides quite a bit of 
comic relief in the graphic novel. So I was like, you know, I wish they had included that character. But once again, you know, we have a more focused text, the movie, I mean, in this case. So, you know, uh, some things had to be left out necessarily. And then let's talk about Akira. Okay, Akira, the, the, the character or, or the entity, if you will. So the approach to him is very different uh, if you compare the graphic novel to the movie. In the novel, he appears quite early in the game, actually in uh, volume number two, towards the end of volume two, or even in the middle of that volume, we already encounter Akira. Whereas in the film, his appearance is basically turned into part of the climax. So you see it more, more towards the end of the film. Now, in the movie, I'm, I'm talking about the movie here, this is really effective because we have been thinking about this Akira, right? As spectators, we're, we were just waiting for him, right? The name uh, of the title of the film is the name of this character. So we are like, you know, who is this Akira or, or what is him, right? What is he? We have this sense of mystery that we have been creating throughout the movie. So when he finally appears, he has a lot more power uh, to him. It's almost like a revelation by that time, whereas that is not the way it happens in the graphic novel. And he really comes as a kind of a strange type of savior once uh, Tetsuo has developed these powers that he uh, just does not know how to control. And speaking of that, powers that we, are, or the characters, right, are unable to control, the last thing that I wanted to share with you in this exploration of Akira has to do with the main theme of the novel and of the movie. I think Akira uh, focuses on a character who has all of a sudden this absolute power. Right? I think that is basically the main focus of this film, especially, right? The graphic novel also, but especially the film we're talking about here. So this is only one aspect if you look at the manga, right? So it's one of the one of the threats, one of the narrative threats that we have here. But as I said before, because the movie is focused, we really have a central theme that we could identify. And I believe this is it, you know, this idea of absolute power. And I would say that because of this focus, one of the things that happens is that Akira the movie becomes just a wonderful metaphor for adolescence. Okay, that is what I wanted to offer as the central theme right here. Generally speaking, if you think about it this way, during adolescence, you find yourself with all that physical energy, all that power, if you will. And many times, maybe even most of the time, just no sense of purpose, no sense of direction. So basically what I'm saying is you have all this energy all this extra energy that all of a sudden, you know, you have at your disposal. But many times, you know, during that time of life, you just don't know what to do with it, you know. And that is one of the things that you can see here in Akira that could maybe be a metaphor for that, because that is exactly what happens to Tetsuo, okay. All of a sudden he has all this power, and he just doesn't know how to control it. I was thinking of that uh, axiom, I would call it, by Lord Acton. He said, uh, power tends to corrupt, absolute power corrupts absolutely. That is one of the things I believe that you can see in Akira. And this connection, you know, between uh, adolescence or puberty and mutation is something that is actually very common. I'm going to give you probably the best example that, that or, or the most obvious one, which is the X-Men stories, right? These changes that they experience, these mutations, they happen to them during uh, puberty. So it really makes sense because at least I can tell you from my experience, you know, I experienced adolescence as a kind of mutation, you know, I was neither here nor there, you know, we even tend to think of, of adolescence or puberty as a kind of a transitional phase. You're not a child anymore, but you're not an adult yet. It's not really a transitional phase if you ask me, but that's another topic. It's quite complex. But what I'm saying is that is how we perceive this uh, stage in our lives, if you will. So the bottom line here. Uh, no matter how you choose to experience Akira, whether you choose to read the graphic novel first or experience the movie first, I predict that uh, you are going to have an experience that you are not going to forget and you're just not going to be disappointed. If I made a list of the top 10 anime that I have ever seen, uh, Akira would definitely be there. It would be there next to uh, something as dissimilar to it as my neighbor Totoro. Okay, so you would find, uh, I would actually like to do that, you know, put together a list of the 10 best animes or most influential anime uh, that I have seen. So my initial experience of the film, you know, because I went first to the film and then to the graphic novel, that experience of the movie, I would say, was enhanced by the experience of the written text. Maybe, you know, I keep thinking to myself, maybe I, I would have liked it if it had been the other way, if I had first read the, the graphic novel. But that's just the way it happened, you know, and I accept it like that. 
Regarding the film, uh, let me tell you this, I consider that uh, final scene, you know, or next to, to the end of Tetsuo's transformation to be one of the most unforgettable and iconic moments in film history, okay? That is how I see it. To, to me, that, that image, that whole sequence was just, you know, engraved in, in my mind and, and I could not, you know, forget it after I saw it. So my reaction to Akira the film was very similar to the reaction that I had to another movie that I would like to recommend to you right now since we are talking about similar texts here and that is Robocop. Okay, Robocop came out in 1987. So we are talking about texts that we could really put to dialogue and that would be really a great experience to watch these, these two uh, back to back. So, do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? I hope you enjoyed this video. Those were my two cents on Akira, the graphic novel and the film by Katsuhiro Otomo. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.